Okay. Anyway, so let let's get started. Uh, I'll. Uh, so there is a question. Sorry, I I had forgotten to record. So for those who are gonna watch this on YouTube, uh, I had forgotten to record. So there was a question uh, from Sasha uh, about uh, the company around Kuzu now, and. Um, so we are a company now, but we were a research essentially team at the university. Well, I'm still part of the university and the company, uh, but all of my students have moved to the company and my co-founders and students. And my co-founders are basically the people on the Kuzu paper. So they moved to the company and I am affiliated with both the university and the company at this point. And then we have interns who are all from University of Waterloo too. Uh, so they are at the company too, full-time. Uh, so that's the current setup. And uh, so there is, yeah, as I said, about 10 people actively working on Kuzu. So the development is faster. And so that's the the, the state. But uh, we are not at a stage yet where we have a product that we are selling, et cetera, uh, but we are seeded. So there is uh, investment money and so it's an actual company uh co incorporated company and we're a bit more vocal about it at this point uh as there's more activity around kuzu yeah what, so, what's the company name don't mind my asking kuzu inc kuzu yes. inc thank you kuzu incorporated yes that's the name of the company yeah so you so you can follow us on linkedin so i formed a page for Kuzu, Kuzu Inc. on LinkedIn, um, I think a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago. Um, yeah, okay. so that's the answer to that question. So yeah, it's good to see uh, many of you whom I know and a few of you I, I, I didn't know uh, before. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining the user meeting. We'll do this exactly as we did before. Uh, so where uh, Xiang will present essentially what we have done since the last user meeting, which includes three major releases uh, and uh, what we have uh, in, in, the, in our roadmap for the rest of the year and kind of the first quarter of the next, next year, uh, roughly. Uh, and uh, that'll just be minor, sort of five minutes. Most of the time will be spent on the new features and the new tools we have around Kuzu, right? So Xiang, why don't you take over and uh, please stop Xiang at any point for questions. Um, and you know will be as informal as in the is in the previous previous user meetings all right okay good Xiang, I'll right. okay i guess yeah i guess everyone can see my screen at this point yes we do but we also see the rest of your browser i don't know if you have a different presentation mode if this is it that's fine rest of the browser meaning we see the top part of the browser uh, that's fine, I guess. Uh, okay, that's, that's fine. Let me share. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, so hi, everyone. Welcome to our third user meeting, which is also our last user meeting in the year of uh, 2023. For those who attended the user meeting for the first time, let me briefly introduce myself again. Uh, my, name is, my name is Xiang, and I'm one of the core engineers behind Kuzu, and I will be the main presenter for, for, for this user meeting. So as always, we will divide the presentation into two parts. In the first part, we will review what we have done in the past three months, uh, which includes a complete rewrite of our storage layer with a few compression techniques and some performance improvement over the data inge ingestion, a set of new Cypher features, plus uh, our interactive UI Kuzu Explorer. And then for the second part, we'll give a preview of uh, what the team is currently working on and what should be available in the in the future releases. So let's start with our new storage design. Uh, we have moved to a node group based storage. What does node group mean? Um, conceptually, node group is a horizontal partition of the data. So given a table, we can first partition it horizontally into different node groups. And then within each node group, we will apply a columnar uh, oriented layout. This idea is uh, actually very similar to the parquet row group, if you are familiar with the parquet physical layout. So then it comes to the question, why do we want to move into a node group-based storage? 
And the primary reason is that we want a good compression and node group is very compression friendly. So the idea of compression is all about finding common patterns uh, over your data. And the chance of finding this common pattern over a partition of your data is much higher than trying to find it across the entire column. So with node group, we are able to perform compression uh, within each node group, node group independently. So next, let me introduce some of the compression algorithms that we have implemented after moving to the node group based storage. And we will start with bit packing. The idea of bit packing is basically using fewer bits to represent integer values. So if we consider the H column uh, here shown on the right side, uh, let's assume it is defined with the UIN32 data type. So which means for a vanilla column storage, this uh, each entry on this column will take four bytes, that is for the UIN32, so 32 bits uh, per element. But when we look at the domain of this column, uh, we will realize that actually all the elements are within the range of uh, 0 to 55. And to represent values in this range, we don't really need 32 base. We actually only need 6 base because 2 to power 6 is already greater than the max values in this domain, uh, which is 55. So after applying bit packing, each element within this H column will just take 6 bits rather than 32 bits. So here is a benchmark of our, like macro benchmark of our bit packing compression on LDBC 100 common table, uh, length column. Uh, this column has the data type of uh, int 32. So by default, every element should take uh, four bytes, 32 bits, if you don't apply any compression. So without compression, the table takes about two to six gigabytes uh, space on the disk. And after bit packing, the table is sh shrinked into a 1.1 gigabytes, so we achieve a compression rate of uh, about 60%. And one thing to notice here is that this compression not only benefits your on-disk on on size, but also benefits your uh, full table scan performance because you are putting less data from the disk and your query contains uh, less IOs in general. So we see uh, also a performance boost in terms of the full table scan over compressed data. And other than bit packing, we have also implemented string dictionary compression. And the string dictionary compression, the idea behind it is, is to avoid storing duplicate strings. And instead, you want to maintain this duplicate string as a dictionary and only materialize the dictionary itself plus the index uh, uh, of these strings in the dictionary. So let's take a look uh, at the example here for this colors column. If you look at the entire column, we realize there are actually only three unique entries, red, blue, and green. Um, so instead of, instead of materializing this column as it is, what we want to do is we first build a dictionary for the three unique entries, red, blue, and green, as a dictionary. And this dictionary consists of uh, two columns, a data column that's storing the actual strings, the unique string values uh, in a columnar fashion, and an offset columns that store, stores the start offset of each string so that you know how to decode the each unique string from your data column. And then we have an extra index column that stores an index to the offset column for decoding compressed string. So let's take a look at the first entry, red. So instead of materializing red as Prashant, in, in, uh, in your column, uh, Xiang, sorry, Prashant, okay. Prashant, you can yeah, just sorry. unmute and ask. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I just want to understand, uh, is this a new data type, like categorical string or something? Because typically a string is a long form text, right? That won't have as many unique values and it can't be compressed this way. Well, it's not really a new data, but still, uh, so later on when you see the benchmark, you 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 see like for, for uh, for strings that doesn't really have a, a lot of repetition, we okay. pay a, a little bit overhead on the computation side, but on the storage side, it, it actually fall back to a regular like a watch hour type of storage. So just to be clear, this is not limited to short form strings. It could be a long form text as well, right? Slightly longer form. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be any okay. any size. Uh, so okay. this is this is just so uh, to be clear. Everything Xiang is explaining right now is completely transparent to you so users it's completely kind of system level core engine optimizations 
from your perspective, you still store strings the way you did. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change any any of the user facing features of the system, except you know your system will get faster because we do these optimizations. And the, right. the common wisdom is actually um, a lot of the strings that are stored in databases. There will be repetitions in them. So this is a very nice. commonly applied uh, optimization in databases, compression technique in databases. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so let me get back to the example. So when you look at the first entry red in the in the colors, it's we are its corresponding index column will point you to the first entry in the offset column, and that offset column will bring you to the start position of the right string. And based on the start offset and end offset, you are able to decode the first entry in the index column is actually right. And that's how you return the original uh, string content. Uh, back into the back into the system. So uh, and one additional thing to observe here is that the index column and the offset columns are actually integer columns. So we are also able to apply a bit packing compression over this index column and offset columns as well. So here is another benchmark for string dictionary compression. It's again we perform it over LDBC common table, but we pick two different string columns. For the broader use column, uh, it actually contains a lot of reputation because as you expected, there is there is not so many uh, brothers available in the market. So because it has a lot of reputations, the compression rate is pretty high. We are able to uh, see the size goes from uh, 4.2 gigabytes to 270 megabytes after compression. And similar to bit backing, uh, this also benefits your, your, your full table scan because you're doing less IO when scanning across the compressed data. And uh, for the content column, this actually corresponds to what Pranshan was trying to ask. Uh, this, this content column doesn't have uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of reputations. It uh, contains mostly random strings, but still we are able to compress it uh, at some extent. So the size goes from 9.7 gigabytes to 7.5 gigabytes uh, on disk. But when we look at the full table scan, we realize that we are actually paying a little bit of uh, extra overhead while scanning. That's because your total IO doesn't change too much, but you are paying extra computation overhead, decoding those uh, string data on the fly while scanning them into, into the memory. But this uh, performance overhead is, uh, is acceptable compared to the potential gain we could get uh, on, the, uh, on the disk size, uh, on the compressed disk size part. So we also give an end-to-end compression benchmark on the entire LDBC 100 database size. Uh, so the size is not only, this size includes uh, everything, your columnar data, your indices, statistics, and red ahead log, and many other things. So we can see the total size drops from uh, 125 gigabytes to 94 gigabytes after we added the bit packing and string dictionary compression. And in the future, we will continue to add more compression techniques and algorithms so that this size will be reduced further. So other than the storage side change, we have also spent some uh, effort to improve our data ingestion performance. So the most noticeable improvement should come from our parallel CSV reader. So previously we were using a single thread CSV reader because uh, if a string spans multiple lines, their parallel CSV reader cannot guarantee the string to be processed by a specific thread. Uh, however, it's it's also known that multi-line string is, is not a very common case. So we decided to uh, go in the direction to assume CSV file does not have multi-line strings and use parallel CSV reader by default. Uh, if multi-line string indeed exists in your CSV file, we will fall back to a non-parallel reader and everything will still work but with a less faster performance. So another improvement should come from our compression. As we mentioned before, uh, if you compress the data, that means you will write less data to the disk. So less IO will be involved during data ingestion. Although we are indeed paying some cost um, uh, when we compute this compression, but the empirical analysis tells us that IO benefits usually outweigh uh, the overhead of uh, in-memory compression in most of the cases. So compression is still a plus for us for data ingestion. And we also did a lot of uh, optimization at the engineering level, like uh, writing a dedicated casting function to replace C++ standard 
casting functions, which is proved to be not performant enough when we profiled our data ingestion. And here we give another set of numbers uh, about our data ingestion improvement. Uh, the benchmark is carried still on LDBC 100, but on four different tables. The All the experiment is run with, uh, with eight threads. The first two rows of these tables are are node tables. They are common table and person table. For larger node table like comment, the improvement is uh, pretty noticeable. So as you can see here, we get about a 40% performance, 40 performance boost for the comment table. And for the person table, because the table itself is, is rather small, so the difference is uh, actually not uh, noticeable. And the last two rows uh, in this uh, table is for the relationship tables. Uh, we get on average about 10% improvement for when, when we ingest relationship table. And that's because the majority of uh, bottleneck is still uh, on populating a GCC list index, where, 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 which we will continue to optimize uh, in the coming releases. So, uh, so yeah, uh, one second. So first, uh, let's me correct you on one thing. We don't transparently fall back to single threaded CSV reader. So can you go back to that slide? Um, go back previous one. Yeah. So here we kind of, you should run by default, we run parallel CSV reader, but we kind of, if we detect there is multi lines, we'll error. So if you know already that your CSV contains multi line strings, strings that span multi lines of your CSV file then don't run with parallel CSV. There is a separate way to force the system to run in a single threaded way to load the CSV, uh, but we won't transparently fall back to this. Uh, yeah, so that's one thing. The second thing is uh, Martin has a question on Slack channel. Um, he's asking, do we see a particular advantage of having our own storage layer? And have we considered uh, using another storage layer as is, like something like Rocks DB, I believe it would be sort of a good uh, approach. Uh, so that's something back in the day that was proposed, but that's like two and a half years ago that was proposed whether or not, that was it's kind of decided a long time ago, but I mean, I think it's the right thing to do, uh, having our own storage so we can optimize things the way we are because We've got sp special storage structures that we care about, like storing um, jo our join index is like an adjacency list index. And there isn't something that's readily available that would have optimized for that type of uh, data. And we do care about kind of scan performance of the join index. And uh, because we fundamentally care about the joins that you will do. So that's one of the core competencies of Kuzu is fast joins over the relationship tables. So um, we didn't really seriously ever kind of uh, in the beginnings of the project, um, try rocks DB and see how it would perform. But we kind of assumed that, um, you know, we wanted to highly optimize every aspect of uh, that join that that would happen. Yeah, there's another question. So maybe if you ask it, uh, Directly, so ordering uh, index string sort does that improve? Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, there, was a, there was a question on. So looking at Parquet, one of the things I love about Kuzu DB is that is innate support for Parquet. Um, you know, when you're transforming data and you're putting it into CSVs, looking at things like Neptune, Janus Graph, and various others, it's it's very uh, you know uh, volume heavy in data. Whereas if you can, when you put something in Parquet, it innately offers, you know, on say, for example, AWS, it's 92% more efficient to process Parquet um, in machine learning activities, for example. So I love, I really love Kuzu for that. But uh, one of the things I've gained, and I'm really quite a novice uh, relative to the people on this call in a lot of ways, uh, so I'm asking the question, does uh, order in indexes that are strings, so for example, a node um, uh, uh, index that, is it, more, is it more performant to sort by index when their index is a string uh, before um, bulk and ingress? So you mean the like the primary key of a node? Yeah, exactly. So string, if, a... if, you, if you sorted it, would that matter? 
Uh, most likely not. Most likely it won't matter, right? Go on. I mean, my intuition is that it shouldn't matter because we have a... So the, the primary key index is uh, stored, at least indexed. And it's going to be stored uh, as its own column. Okay. Um, and it's unique. So our dictionary compression won't matter for that. Because, Interesting, primary, because the in, in primary the index, index uh, and the index, sorry, one second. In the index over it will be hash index. So oh, I think I hashed anyways. So I don't think it will matter. It shouldn't really have an effect on the loading time or the query performance time. Yeah. But okay. it depends if you if you sort them uh not on the node table, but on the real table. It's, so mean that, that you sort it in one way, like basically I sort based on my a source node primary key in my real CSV files. Okay. And that could... Uh, real real means relationship table, by the way, just to be yeah. clear. So, yeah, so if you for your relationship tables, in that case, they're not primary key. Relationship tables don't have primary keys. They're kind of yeah. identified by the source and destination uh, IDs and internal IDs that we give. Um, so if you, I think Godong is saying that if you sort that by say your source uh, or destination, that might speed up your loading time a bit. But uh, I think after you load, it wouldn't speed up your queries though. But I think initial it loading, was, it might speed up. There was an issue. There was a, a consideration that I came across in uh, deduplication of data. So I found it difficult initially with Kuzu to deduplicate because of mer the, was likely my lack of understanding on merge. Um, where, you know, something like Neo4j will handle duplication as you're ingressing in bulk loading. Um, so we we built it such that we deduplicate and through deduplication, um, the speed of de deduplication prior to ingress with Parquet sort uh, expedited substantially the performance and speed of the deduplication on really large data sets. So I guess my question was related to broadly to ingress deduplication for merge. Would would it have an impact there? Do you think? So if you have, what do we do right now? Actually, if you have in your node table multiple primary keys that are duplicated, what do we do? Do we skip them or do we? No, we we currently would throw error because. The error. Yeah. So, yeah, so in our case, will error anyways if you've got right. on your nodes mm -hmm. and in your rels we don't error because we just in ingest them separately as separate relationships. Um, okay, so that, that's great to know. Case, in our case, it won't have an effect yeah. so far. But we could. So uh -huh. That brings up another thing. We can have a mode where we do the. Maybe we should actually. It makes sense. We can have. Yeah. We can do the deduplication and not error explicitly and kind of silently ignore the second parts but that would be so that, helpful that would be so helpful. in that case yeah. it won't matter i think it won't yeah, matter we, to our speed we, we can log because, the... because otherwise the deduplication process if you're updating a data set say for a table uh, for a node say company um, and you have updated data um, we want to update the properties perhaps because it's new data but we uh, and we we want to skip the actual node creation if it's already there. If you see what I mean. So at the moment we we handle that um, to produce the data that is suitable for bulk load to into Kuzu. So thank you for that. That was a, a, a okay. We, I can we can we can open an issue about this. Yeah. Uh, silently uh, ignoring the tickets. Uh, okay, so maybe it's, let's it move speeds forward. Up, it, speed, it would speed up ingress. Neo4j, many others, is going to take that approach. Approach. So, you know, we it, the difficulty is how do we get it in there? You know, how do we keep things updated? Uh, so at the moment, it's on the user. Okay, sounds good. So, Xiang, why don't you continue? Okay, all right. Uh, so, so since we have covered the changes related to uh, performance, um, next let's take a look at the set of uh, new Cypher features that were added in the past a few months. So first we have this uh, load from clause, which corresponds to the new 40 load CSV from. Uh, this clause basically, load from clause basically allow you to directly scanning a file without uh, explicitly loading it into your database. 
And the file type is not just limited to CSV. Essentially, any file that can be copied into your database can also be used here in the load from clause. So here we give an example of uh, loading from a parquet file and returning every column from, from, from the file. And just like a match clause, you can combine your load from with other clauses like var clause and return clause. So basically this load from clause can be used in the exact same way as a match clause. So in the example, bottom right example here, we, we, we show an we show that we are loading from a user.csv, filtering its first column, uh, and then returning the const star as an aggregation result. And similar to our data ingestion, our load from use parallel strategy by default, which means if you are scanning a CSV, we will be assuming uh, it doesn't have multi-line strings by default. And instead of scanning from files, we have also implemented the direct scan from pandas data frame through this uh, read pandas function. So you could pass data frame object as a parameter of the read pandas function, and it will scan the, the, the data frame as a regular table. So in the red example, uh, we first create a person data frame and then propagate this data frame into the cipher statement, scan this data frame, calculating the average height, and then find all the students that is taller than this average uh, through another match cost. So that's basically how you combine the query of uh, Pandas data frame together with uh, other data in your, in your database uh, through a Python interface. And, uh, uh, and another thing to, that worth mentioning here is that data frame actually have a, a lot of uh, backends. So it can have NumPy backend, Pyro backend or even Python dictionary backend. What we currently support is the NumPy backend. Uh, other backends we are still implementing and should come uh, progressively in the in the in the future releases. And for the data export, we now support copy to parquet uh, with snappy compression by default. So you could uh, export your 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 query result into a parquet format through this copy to statement. And for copy to CSV, we now uh, allowing you to change several configurations like what is your delimiter, what is the quotations, and whether your CSV should uh, be written with a header or not. We have also rewrite the CSV writer and make it 10 times faster uh, compared, compared to our pre previous version. Um, so here we show the performance number to export a common table yeah, which previously takes us more than ten, uh, more than thousand seconds, and with the rewrite, the newest version, it takes us about a hundred seconds to export this uh, uh, common table. And the table size, as we have seen in the previous slides, is about twenty-two gigabytes uh, in total uh, when dumping as a CSV file. On the update side, uh, we have now added, uh, or I guess there's a question. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I was really excited by the um, pandas aspect. Can we, uh, uh, using load, can we actually go straight from a pandas data frame to load Kuzu DB with that, with this, um, with this call? You mean, uh, yeah, like so rather than saying copy, <laughs> like we have it at the moment, we process data, we it, it's all in pandas, we put it out, uh, the, the output in Parquet to then copy into Kuzu DB. Can we just go, is this offering an ability to go straight from data frame dynamically into Kuzu? Um, very soon we will expose the copy from Panda data frame. So with this, with the current like read pandas function, you can only do the call and then create. So use the create statement which is not as performant as uh, as a uh, bulk loading uh, mm -hmm. as you would expect okay uh, so if you're if you're dealing with a very large data frame i would suggest a uh, bit a bit for the bulk loading version of uh, copy from pandas um, thank you thank you if you're much. dealing with small data if if your data size is small i guess it doesn't matter so you could use a create uh, followed by the read pandas Function that will uh, update your database as well. Thanks for your thanks. But for it's but it's in our roadmap. That's a good feature, and it's in our roadmap. But we don't we don't we don't have it yet. But right now you can 
essentially bind your some variables to the rows in a data frame and then keep processing them. But you can't do copy from then the Panda data frames into this table in bulk. So that you can't yet do, but uh, you know, that's in our roadmap then. Thank you. Yeah, and then on the update side, uh, we have added detach delete. So different from regular delete, in regular delete, it doesn't allow you to delete a node that still connects to some relationship. So with detach delete, you can actually now del delete uh, a node and also together with all the relationships connected to this node. So the query on the right side will uh, delete the all the records in your database because you are first finding all the nodes in the in the graph and then detach this node, meaning deleting node itself and also relationships connecting to the nodes. So that means everything in your graph will be deleted. deleted. So with detach delete implemented, uh, we should now also cover all new 4 update clause at this point. So other than detach delete, other than detach delete, we also now allows you to return a deleted record. So you could say, uh, you could say, I want to delete all the nodes and also return me this uh, deleted nodes uh, in a in a single statement. Um, on the transaction side, previously we used to expose transaction interface only at the API level. So that means you have to. Uh, explicitly call this uh, APIs uh, in your language binding, uh, like begin write transaction or commit, those APIs are associated with your connection. And the problem of this approach is obvious. First, you have to maintain all the transaction APIs in all language bindings, which is extra work for, 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 for us. And for command line interface users, there's no way to opt in transactions. So we now have switched to a different step strategy by using transaction statement in a similar fashion as uh, Postgres. So here you could um, begin a transaction, start a transaction using the begin transaction keyword, which will start a transaction for you and for you can perform any read read queries. If you want to start a read only transaction, simply append the read only keyword after begin transaction. And commit statement will produce all your changes in the current tra transaction to the disk, and rollback will discard all the ch changes uh, from the current transaction. So we have switched to this uh, transaction statement for our transactions. For the data types, uh, we now added the unsigned int and huge int. If you ever encountered overflow overflow problem in the in the system, uh, huge int will most likely solve it for you. Um, for the functions, uh, as always, we add several functions every release, which you can find in our website uh, documentation in particular. Um, there's one change related to function I want to mention in the user meeting this time. Uh, that is, we have moved to a SQL style casting function, which takes an input and a target type and try to cast the input to, to this uh, target type. So the example on the right side shows that it takes a string input and try to cast to list of integers. With this uh, new type of uh, casting function, we have deprecated our previous casting functions, which put the target type as part of the function name. So this, this way of naming makes it very hard to define a casting function for recursive data type, like list, because primitive data type, you can, you, you can define it as two int, two double, two string. But for recursive data types, you have to provide both the list type itself and also the child type. So it's it's almost impossible to, to define a function, casting function uh, using the 2x type of uh, naming. So we have deprecated this previous casting functions and we encourage you to use the SQL style cast function in the future. Um, so for one second. So for recursive pattern, uh, we now have a complete support to filter intermediate nodes and relationships. So we use the uh, uh, unpacking syntax as memgraph because Neo4j doesn't have a way to filter intermediate nodes and relationships to, to, to my knowledge. So the query here show, tries to find all the person followed by item within one to two hops. And we further constrain that all the follows add should before 
2022, and all the intermediate followers should have an age greater than 45. Uh, if we forget about these uh, constraints and simply try to find all the paths that satisfy the one to two hop recursive pattern, uh, we will end up with four paths. So the Adam to Carissa, Adam to Zhang, Adam to Carissa to Zhang, and Adam to Zhang to Nora. And this four within this four path, actually the last two doesn't really qualify our constraint because the Carissa uh, has age 40, which violates our predicate uh, n dot h greater than 45 uh, in this recursive pattern. So the third path violates this. Um, and the fourth path also doesn't qualify because the edge between John to Nora is actually since 2022, which violates the R dot signs smaller than 2022 constraint. So we end up with uh, just uh, Adam to Carissa and Adam to John two path for this particular query. So that's our recursive pattern filter. Um, for the subquery part, we added the count subquery that counts the number of number that counts the number of matches uh, of a given pattern. So in this exact in this example, we try to count the number of followers for each person and sort based on, and sort the result based on the number of followers. So this can be done by doing a match of each user, and then at the return clause, you try to count the uh, incoming follows edge for each for each of the user as a number of followers. So what we end up with, uh, Adam has no incoming follows edge. Carissa and Nora both have one incoming edge. Uh, and then John has two incoming edges. So you get the number of fo followers through this concept query easily. Uh, she has um, a good question. On the yeah. Uh, so in this query, what, is there a benefit of using the subquery over a pattern match? Sorry, like a width statement, like uh, chaining two uh, separate queries together? Chaining two separate... Uh, it this, depends. Like, this, 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 I... this looks easier to write to me, at least. Okay. To okay. Begin with. Uh, performance wise, uh, do we know? Do we really understand the, is the completion? Yeah, it performance wise... Depends on how you the width is, query, I think. It's difficult to say. Wise, uh, it's not difficult to say. I think performance wise, there should be no difference. Like uh, the the optimizer doesn't really care care how your query is written. Like as long as they are semantically equivalent, it will be go through the a similar optimization stage. This, at yeah. least that's the ideal case. That's that's yeah. that's uh, quite so interesting. It actually does matter how you write the query in general. Uh, so you know. It's difficult to say, Prashant, I think. Well, it really depends on how you wrote the width query because, you know, people do end up writing the same computation in very different queries. And it's difficult to predict uh, how the optimizer uh, will perform for very simple yeah, things. My, my, my only concern with this sort of... Uh, sorry, for my only concern with this kind of syntax mm -hmm. is that... Uh, it can lead to, uh, I guess, readability issues if it's a long line because, like, multi-line like queries in Cipher aren't exactly, you know, common out there. It's hard to actually see how this becomes readable when you have a longer subquery. I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, having looked at um, examples extensively with Kuzo, I, I really love the way um, the concise capability of a query like this. But when you're working within a team and trying to sort of upskill people, um, separation of you know, components within the query is I found more maintainable, but I don't think it should stop the the drive that you're doing here. I think it's of course uh, no, of course, yeah, it's offering a greater level of maturity uh, longer term. Hmm. Martin also has a question. Martin, yeah, so related to the optimization, like do you does does Kuzu anywhere have any kind of optimization boundaries? Like let's say with a width, let's say if you be if you would. You could imagine that that's an optimization boundary. That is not the case. Like, is it always optimized as one entire query? Well, Xiang, I'll, I'll let you answer. But we 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 don't like we we separate the parts, right, Xiang? Uh, like for that's a actually an interesting question. So we have different optimization strategies. Or the joint order indeed separates uh, by query parts. So we optimize joint order only within. Uh, a query part, uh, a query the part. Query part, uh, by, to be, the query part is a match where 
with or match where return. That's a query part. But you could have like five of them and we'll, we'll optimize the joins within each one separately. So we'll follow. So there's a way you can dictate actually that I want this part of the join to be done first and we'll do it. And then second part, so on and so forth. Ideally, we've thought about this, that, you know, obviously it is possible to completely ignore those query part boundaries and try to optimize the entire thing. Uh, but it's harder to write that optimizer. And um, there might this also gives the users a way to say, like, I want this executed first. And that is, it, you know, so, you know, we've somehow picked pick that way of optimizing it. Uh, but right. Yeah, no, I understand. Well, yeah, yeah. Xiang, Xiang yeah. is going to say something oh. else. Let, let me add one more point. So only for join order, it is uh, uh, bounded by query part. Other optimizers, we, we actually apply it across, like we, we compile into a logical plan. We apply the optimization over logical plan. So there's no longer boundaries. It's a, applied across the full statement that includes like filter push down, projection push down, things like that. It's applied mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to the... Yeah. So first, so basically, just maybe one more minute. I want to explain how optimization happens. So we take the query, query part, query part. We get a join order, but the join order optimization actually happens as part of query compilation. So it, it's not like we first get a naive join order and optimize. We kind of optimize the joins uh, with the filters together. So we get a, a join optimized sort of sub plan. And then we put the other query parts together and we form an entire plan. So that's our first plan that we form. And then we have a set of optimizations that are uh, like pushing down further filters, pushing down projections and things like that, that all happen um, afterwards to make that plan better and better, hopefully through a sequence of uh, optimizations that we apply. So that's the, that's the full pipeline of how optimization happens. Uh -huh, cool. And then the question about specific subquery here. So this is a uh, group by, right? So like in the previous user meeting, you mentioned uh, the decorrelation paper um, and if you implement that. So like this is this, yeah, yeah, is yeah. this subject, is the, this subquery is subject to the same decorrelation techniques? Yes. I, all the subquery will go through the same decorrelation. Uh, uh -huh. Okay, cool. So, so decorrelation basically means you, you, you don't, you don't execute it uh, for every ace. So instead you try to, so you, you, you how do I articulate this? So decorrelation means you don't do an index sensitive loop join for your subquery because you don't know how many uh, incoming tuples you will expect. Uh, so instead you try to do a hash join uh, type of uh, computation for the subquery. Um, all right. So I was talking about API on the API side. Uh, we have a we now have a read only mode um, when, when you open the database. So by default, the database always starts with read write mode, meaning you can issue arbitrary type of queries. When you only when you open the database in a read only mode, then any update update queries uh, in this uh, database will be re rejected. So we implement this read only mode through file logs. So for each database directory, at any point, there can be at most one read-read database. But you can have, uh, in the meantime, you can have an uh, arbitrary number of uh, read-only databases. So in order to start a read-only database, you simply need to change the read-only flag uh, to true in the system config. So that uh, system config is, uh, is implemented in all language bindings when you construct your database object. And uh, we have uh, received a few feedbacks about the limitation of modeling uh, that our rel rel table can only be can only have one pair of uh, from two. So that indeed creates trouble at the modeling stage. So imagine you are trying to model your data as uh, two tables, uh, two nodes tables, user and city, and one relationship table nodes that could connect it, both user and user, uh, and also user and city. So due to our uh, previous limitation of a uh, rel table can only have one from two uh, uh, node table pairs. You will need to create two separate rel tables, one for user user and the other for user city. With uh, in order to solve this, we 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 release this uh, experimental feature, which we call as a rel group, that can be considered conceptually as a union of multiple relationship tables. 
So when you define a rel, rel group, you can actually put multiple from two pairs and the rest of syntax is the same as uh, creating a rel table. And then at the query time, you can use the rel table in the exact same way as a regular, uh, you, sorry, you can use rel group in the exact same way as a regular rel table. So here, for example, you can directly query A nodes B using the rel group. And this query is equivalent to the multi-label query uh, by substituting su substitute your uh, rel group with the union of uh, multiple rel tables. So it's equivalent to a nose user user union nose user city to B. So the two queries shown here are actually equivalent, will give you the exact same output. Um, this rel group is uh, still an experimental feature. So if you are using it, we would like to hear the feedbacks uh, so that we can adjust it and make it more, more usable in the, in the future. And finally, we have some uh, developer related changes. Sorry, can, can, I ask about, have set up... can I ask something about the rel group briefly? Yeah. Sorry, before you jump. The, I, uh, I realized that I was skimming the docs on this. I didn't really understand it at the time. Um, I initially thought that you were doing something like hyper edges, let's say like where you have like a relationship between three things, but that's not the case, right? This is purely to address the problem that you have to have a relationship between two specific types, right? And you want to have a relationship between uh, nodes of different types. So it's like a union, right? Is, is that it? That's it. It's a, it's a user uh -huh. rather than a hyper edge. Uh, so no, quick, quick, quick question, uh, yeah. The syntactic sugar, basically, so that you can give a single name to multiple relations so that mm -hmm. because uh, of our limitation that each relation needs to be between two specific node tables. But sometimes, you, yeah. say, you know, again, in this example, I want to have a nose relationship, but I want it to be from users to users or users to cities. So I want to be able to query it that way. And as a syntactic sugar, uh, you can just define this nose to the system as this rel group, just and then uh, write queries with this nose, which is a virtual edge, virtual relationship. And then we'll kind of compile it to uh, the actual or statement that's shown at the bottom here. Uh, uh -huh. quick, quick question. Uh, so, uh, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, let me finish this part. And let's say if you have 500 of those, would that be bad or? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, uh, okay. My, my question right leads on to that because, yeah, there was a scalability thing there that I could see as well. That was a really good question. So I, I wanted to ask off the back of that can you have groups of groups? No, um, we, no, we cannot have. We you cannot can't have, have group. but so if you have many of them, you're asking a hard question. I mean, hard query because you're asking, you're drawing that. over five hundred possible kind of relationships. So it, it is a hard, hard, hard query. So it will suffer. But I mean, it's not going to be worse than asking a common question query, yeah. which is. A join B without specifying any relation, in which case you're asking for all possible joins in your database, which is a hard query as well. But, you know, that's an advantage of usability advantage, basically. It's easy to write the query, so you don't have to write these complex unions of joins. Uh, but the, obviously, the speed will not be, will be slower. This, this offers more granularity. Yeah. yeah. This offers more granularity in it, so it's not really, yeah, you can go for you can group things that are going to be um, commonly queried for performance gain, right. I guess, yeah. rather than, you know, producing this as sort of a whole scheme or infrastructure. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'm still uh, processing so, it. I get it. So you, users from Neo4j will relate with this in terms of multi-label nodes, right, Shyam? Like, yeah. basically, this is feature parity with Neo4j in terms of multi-label capability. I I think they allow both. Like, you could model as a... Like you can also as a single from two and use the multi-label um, uh, at the query time. And they also allows you to directly model as a rel table with multiple from twos. So your 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 foreign key can come from different node tables. Oh, uh, okay. Yes. Uh, Neo4j so is- You could have- uh, Go ahead, sorry, Xian. Uh, so, so I mean, Neo4j, you can have both. You could, So you can define a nose or you like, uh, like you can define a rel table and then using using a sorry you can define a rel table over multiple from and to 
and then still use a multi-label query on those uh, real tables. So you can do both things together. Though I think technically you only need one of them to, to if you just want to achieve the functionality. Yeah, in Neo4j, they use as a filter, basically. Like if you want to, it's kind of what you're doing here in your last line. Um, if I want to se separate only a subset of relationships in a parent relationship, that's it. So it's like a multi-label is just like a filter for narrowing down on the kinds of relationships I, I care about. Yeah, pretty much. So, so, some more examples. I know you guys work really hard, but some more examples around this would be really helpful, I think, just yeah. for common use cases. Yeah. It, looks, it offers a lot, actually. I can see sort of in principle, but I'm still processing it. Um, and to, to align it to simple use cases would be really helpful. Just a few more. And with different types of data sets. Okay. Yeah, uh, just... Yes. Quick, maybe so that not asking for um, money. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. No, we are a, we are a little late, so I I just want to go through the rest of the slides. And uh, Chunk needs to was looking uh, was going to present Kuzi Explorer a little bit. So, uh, yeah. Okay. That's, so that's uh, let me quickly. Yeah. yeah. I have I have one last slide. So we have the nightly build. So in case you want to use the latest master version, uh, you can pull uh, our nightly build. Uh, uh, from 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 like by looking at our docu documentation, it contains the instructions, and also we have a reduced binary size uh, by 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 sixty percent, about seventy five percent, I guess. Uh, okay, let, let me handle to... mainly from removing Apache error dependency, which was a huge thing, and then uh, Keenan, uh, who is one of our interns, did some optimizations to. Uh, uh, strip some uh, symbols from the binaries, which also helped. So yeah, we are around 10 megabytes right now uh, as a library. Yeah. Okay. So next, uh, the, I'll, I'll hand over to Chan to give a demo of our Kuzvi Explorer. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Let me get started. Uh, so I will briefly demo Kudzu Explorer, which is a web application where it developed to visualize Kudzu query results and schema. So the Kudzu Explorer is currently deployed as a Docker image. So you can launch Kudzu Explorer with this single command of running Docker. Um, and the way option here can mount a local database. This is the path to the local database into the container. And the P option uh, does the port mapping. And after I run this command, uh, so the Kudzu Explorer will be running at port 8000 locally. And I can access it through the web browser. So here uh, I have a console where I can type in queries. And when I type in query, I also get uh, syntax highlighting and auto completion feature. So let's just do this thing. And if I return uh, nodes and edges from this query, then after I run it, it will just generate this visualization as shown here. And this visualization can be customized so here is this setting panel. Uh, you can change the color of everything and change the size and also the caption. Um, and then this will give you a slightly different visualization. And there is also this side panel here. If you click on any node or edge, it will show you the property. And uh, other than this graph visualization, you can also show this query result as a table or as the raw JSON output. Uh, so the next feature we have for this web application is to visualize and modify the schema. So if you switch to this schema view, uh, you can see all the nodes and relationship tables here. And you can also uh, add it a node table here. So for example, if I add a property gender here, uh, set it maybe as a string, 
then it will automatically generate this DDL statement and I can execute it right away, which modifies the schema. And also uh, you can just drop uh, tables here if you want uh, or add new uh, nodes or edge tables. So for example, I can add this college here and then I can add a new uh, add hands table, uh, which from the user to the college, and I can save it right here. Uh, and finally, uh, this uh, web application is bundled with a few data sets. Uh, so here I already uh, have a database, so it will not allow me to load anything to avoid conflict. However, if I just restart this without a database or with an empty database, and then maybe I refresh, so this will allow me to load a bundled database. For example, I can load the LDBC SMB dataset here, uh, and it will give me this schema here, and then I can run queries over this LDBC dataset. Uh, and lastly, uh, this thing is also available at the Kuzu uh, website as an online demo. So if you click on this try Kuzu here, it will launch Kuzu Explorer in read only mode with LDBC.1 dataset. And you can run any query that does not modify the database from this console. Uh, so this is still an early stage project. If you have any suggestions or feature uh, requests, just let us know. Um, I, I would like to say something. I've been looking very, very heavily at G6 and, and, v, and G6 VP. I really like to offline um, offer you some, um, some of our proof concepts. Um, and and we, we're looking specifically at that integration into our POCs into QC DB, DB, which we, which we kind of have. We really love the work that you've done on that. It's extensive. Thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to show what we're doing as well with it. Um, I think there's some really good um, things we could offer each other. Um, and the, the only dumb thing I want to say, which I should have raised as an issue on uh, GitHub, I apologize for doing it on a YouTube video, but it'd be great to have a spin up when, when, when a query is processing. So we're, we're processing quite big data sets. Um, you know, we'll, we fill their big data sets, and it's unclear when when the when the um, when the when a query is waiting for a response in the Explorer interface, and that's the only I slight, currently slight issue. I, I would say small one, but thank you for that work. It's really really helpful. I think Tom was saying that currently we we were already working on that, so it will we it should be out for us. I think we already have it. So if you just put the latest image, you should have it. I'll reach out and drop you a link to some of the stuff we're working on um, over the next week. But thank you. It's really, really exciting. Thank you. Xiang, uh, maybe just wrap up with the things that yes, uh, let me let me quickly wrap up the 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 the, the... The second part, which is about our our, our roadmap for the rest of the year, uh, for the for the, and the next quarter. So, so what we are doing? Um, for first, it's about the native RDF support. We have been talking this since our first user meeting, and uh, finally, we are we are we are approaching it. Uh, we are we are quite close to getting the first version of uh, RDF alt, and uh, the feature is mostly done. So we are internally we are entering into a testing stage very soon. So this is something you could expect uh, that will come in the in the in the next release. So on the on the, on the side we have people that looking into extension framework. Just one second. Can you go back. I just go back just to remind people uh, who were not here. All right. So this is essentially in this feature is a, an extension of our data model, so we can natively support um, RDF triples. Uh, and we had a proposal for this uh, on uh, one of our issues, 
back in God knows when, maybe May or April even, or June, I don't know, it's been a while. Uh, and we've been working on that proposal basically as a way to essentially, uh, the, basically what will happen is that not only will you have your node tables and relationship tables as you have now, which have properties on nodes and edges, you could also have RDF graphs as a separate entity in the data model and load into it triples. And RDF is basically a lot more flexible than uh, property graphs, uh, which are quite close to essentially relational tables with specific tables being identified as nodes and other specific tables being identified as relationships. Uh, but uh, RDF in RDF, the data model is much more flexible. Uh, essentially, everything is an object or a resource, and they're identified by these stringed um, IRIs which are like URLs. And um, so it's a, a kind of- can I, can I ask a question on it? An, an, interesting, so an, interesting, an interesting experiment we'll do, uh, trying to extend our data model. So we could also natively support RDF graphs, uh, which are more common in these uh, data sets that people call knowledge graphs. So so that this is our proposal and, and we'll see, we'll see um, uh, the utility of this, yeah. Sorry for over, over talking. I think that's absolutely brilliant. A lot of work in it um, and much appreciated. I wanted to uh, just give a, an insight that I, I came across. I was looking at uh, the difference uh, comparing how um, uh, AWS Neptune, Janus Graph, um, and Neo4j handle uh, RDF and uh, property graph databases. Um, and one of the uh, differences I found, uh, which was quite significant, was that there's a duplication of data required when a graph in say, I think it's Janus Graph AWS Neptune, you have to duplicate the data um, uh, where you wanna use that data set in both RDF and property graph. So um, I was wondering, has there been uh, any consideration about um, that type of issue um, or have you come across that? at all in your in the research of this so uh, why don't i take this offline so okay. it, kind of in, in the interest of time uh but just the short answer is that you so the way you load these things are different okay. so you one of them in is you need to give us a set of triples and in the other one you need to give us a set of node tables and rel tables which means kind of by design, you need to duplicate your data, if I understand your question correctly. Yeah, that, 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 that's right. In one of them, we're just expecting triples. Yeah. Uh, in the other one, we're expecting structured node tables, structured relationship tables. So yeah. therefore, the way you have to present it to us, needs to give it to us, ingest it into Kuzu, it needs to be different. Yeah, but that there is a, a mar in the marketplace, there's, there is two different distinct approaches. One, it offers the duplication, um, as you're suggesting, and one seemingly doesn't, which just seems to be Neo4j. So take it offline, It'd be great to explore that. Yeah, Thank you. Nice, yeah. yeah, okay, we can, take, we can take this offline. Good, yeah. Yeah, so let me wrap up the, the rest. So we have uh, someone looking at the extension framework. So this is can be considered as a more powerful version of UDF because that will allow you to customize, like extend any component of the system, theoretically at least. And with the extension framework, we will implement our remote file system uh, as a built-in extension. So this remote file system will basically about scanning uh, objects uh, directly from uh, S3 or GCP, uh, Google Cloud Platform. Um, so we are putting people into uh, more engineers into testing. Uh, so that includes migrating test cases from other sources uh, and also building a more powerful testing infrastructure, like fuzzy testing infrastructure. Um, on the platform wise, we are compiling a WebAssembly version uh, of Kuzu so that you can run Kuzu actually natively in the, in, in, the, in the browser. And finally, for the storage team, they are optimizing the update and transaction. Uh, so specifically, we will give uh, more, much more performance updates uh, in the coming releases uh, that, that will support concurrent write to uh, multi-version concurrency control. So that's basically what we are doing uh, in the rest of the year plus next quarter. So all this, uh, you will see updates uh, in the next few user meetings, hopefully. 
All right. So that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Great. If you can take some more questions, uh, if you have any. I guess, Prashant, do you have a question? I saw something on Slack, some notification. Uh, no, no, no question. No questions? OK. All right. Any questions from anyone? No questions. Just want to say how awesome it is. And thank you so much to the community. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for attending. And yeah, please uh, spread the word. Yeah, we are uh, still uh, in our beginnings and uh, we are trying to grow a community. So uh, if you find people who could use Kuzu, uh, we'd appreciate uh, you uh, talking about it. And if, there is, if you are using Kuzu and uh, you'd like to collaborate on a blog post or something, uh, do reach out. We'd be happy to help uh, write one and post it on our blogs, right? Good. All right. Let's wrap it up then. Thank you very much, Xiang, Chang, and uh, uh, everyone for joining. Thank you very much, everyone. Great work. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.